Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to begin today with a quotation from Stephen W. Smith. He's a Baptist preacher of a megachurch, but he wrote a book called The Lazarus, Lazarus's Life, which is where this quotation comes from. Jesus knew that no smell was more distasteful than the smell of religious people. He saved his harshest criticism for the smelly, right-wing adherence of the faith. The smell of adultery, theft, swindling, jealousy, doubt, and the rejection of faith did not appear to compare in Jesus' heart to the smell of self-righteousness. But true to his way of dealing with smelly people, even those who thought that they were spiritually superior to others, they were welcomed to be in his presence. Stephen Smith here was citing actually the lead-in to the Gospel of John chapter 3, which precedes directly our text for today. And it actually talks about Nicodemus approaching Jesus. And he comes, as you know the story, by cover of darkness. What's intriguing is that he begins his approach to Jesus with a compliment, saying, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher that comes from God, for no one could possibly do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, unless you're a Buddhist or potentially demonically possessed, I think you'd take this as a compliment. But how does Jesus respond? He responds with a theological challenge to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, Nicodemus is scratching his head and thrown for a bit of a loss here, so he comes back. How can a man be born when he's already old? And Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Don't marvel, Nicodemus, that I say this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, now contemplating how can he again go into his mother's womb and be born again, is thrown for a bit of a loop, and he says, How can these things be? Jesus replies, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can I tell you heavenly things and have you understand? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So we say, what, Jesus? Nicodemus started out flattering you with a comment question, and you come back hammering him with a set of head scratchers followed by a put down. So much for a modern teaching axiom, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Sort of throw that out, didn't he? So, 2 Corinthians, however, 5 7 gives us insight into really the perspective of Jesus. As Paul says, we walk by faith not by sight. Nicodemus was possibly tainted just a little bit with the self-righteousness of his position. He was the head, you see, of the, or he was a member of the 70-member Sanhedrin. It was the supreme court of the time. It was the ruling body that basically governed everything relative to proper management of the temple law to following Moses' Old Testament law called the Torah. They could govern it all, and they could prosecute anyone, including somebody considered a false prophet, up unto the point of death, which required going to the Roman governor. This is the same body, as you know, that actually tried Jesus and brought him in front of Pontius Pilate. This is the same body that actually gave Paul the authorization to prosecute Christians before he was converted by Christ himself on the road to Damascus. Nicodemus, possibly tainted just a little bit with self-righteousness, started to talk about 
signs, and they were really sight comments. They were comments that said, nothing's wrong on the surface by what I see, but Jesus wants to move him deeper. He wants to move him to faith, to the things unseen, to the work of the Holy Spirit, to rebirth as a believer in one whose human and divine natures were put together in one person, the Son of God, the incarnate Christ. Now Jesus, however, starts bringing clarity to the message by breaking things down for Nick at night. And he starts by referring Nicodemus to the Old Testament, to Numbers 21. And this is a picture right here of, on the left, is the cross, and it's a monument on Mount Nebo in Jordan. And this isn't exactly where Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, the brass serpent, so that those looking at it could be saved, but it's where God took Moses to look out on Mount Nebo over into the promised land to see where the children of Israel were to be led. It's a foreshadowing of Christ's own execution as he was lifted up on the cross. And as John says, just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him, the crucified one, may have eternal life, quoting Jesus our Lord. This slide recalls that bronze serpent, and then this slide is Michelangelo's representation of it in the Sistine Chapel. It's a beautiful depiction, but you can see those that did that refused maybe or ignored the promise to look toward that brass serpent and be saved did indeed perish, but they had a choice. And those that looked toward it, that looked toward it, not just at it, and saw by faith that they would be saved, but also saw by sight that others were getting saved, believed, and they had temporal life. 12th century Roman Catholic bishop Bruman Bruno of Sengi really provides a unique comment on this particular picture and when he says the following, Moses raised up a bronze serpent in the wilderness of the people where they were smitten by fiery serpents and they might see it and of course be healed. So also Christ was raised up on the cross that whoever sees him with the eyes of the mind and believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. For there is no other medicine that's able to heal man from the first poison of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The Lord properly wished to be figured as that bronze serpent, since as that serpent possessed a real likeness to the fiery serpents that were biting the children of Israel, yet it did not have the harmful poison of a serpent, so also our Savior on the cross, although regarded by many at that time as a sinner, and crucified between robbers, and having the likeness of the flesh of sin, as the apostle says, nonetheless was himself without sin, for he appeared in the likeness of the flesh of sin, so that because of sin he might contend sin in the flesh. Romans 8, 3. Jesus condenses his gospel message to Nicodemus now even further. He links him to the Old Testament, to Moses, to the correlation and then he connects the dots. Moses and God. You can see the brass serpent and Christ on the cross. Yes, in both cases, the people are to look toward Christ, not just at him. On the case of Moses with the serpent, they did have some sight visual evidence that their belief caused people to live. In the case of the cross, we know it's internally, it's by faith, it's by full trust on things unseen. One led to temporal life, but Christ dead, death leads, of course, to eternal life. And then he breaks things down even further for Nick at night by putting things in a nutshell. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This gospel in a nutshell is probably the most, not probably, it is the most recognized Bible verse um, of all. Billy Graham, for him, that, you know, the late Billy Graham, the evangelist, this was his favorite verse. It was also my confirmation verse and may have been the confirmation verse of many of you 
many of you out there today. It's so widely known that unfortunately, its meaning is often blunted because we know it too well. But it deals with the greatest mysteries of our faith, with life, with death, with the bloody sacrifice, and with eternal hope. And breaking it down for Nicodemus, you can see that it talks about what the penalty of not believing is, not having faith given to us by the Holy Spirit, not because of our own reason or strength, but we do have free will to reject the Spirit, and we then will perish. And it talks about the design that God has. He sent his only Son, and he so loved the world because of that to send his Son. And it talks about our duty. Our duty is minor. It's just not to reject. The Holy Spirit does all the work in us, as you know. It's not anything on our end. But then it talks about our destiny, which is eternal life. The gospel, in a nutshell, helped Nicodemus grasp the connection between Christ's baptism, where he stepped his foot in the Jordan River, and he bore the sins on his shoulders, symbolically, of the entire world, so that we could be cleansed of ours. And then he went on the cross, and by the shedding of his blood, he then represented the merger of water with blood, the purification for our benefit that we share in his supper. It's the gospel in a nutshell. And it brings us to our baptism, where when we get immersed or when we get sprinkled on with water, we share in that gift of the Holy Spirit. We are united actually with the message that Christ gave to Nicodemus, which wasn't actually then about our baptism or his baptism. It was about Christ's baptism being the precursor to his death on the cross. And when we go to the cross, and we look at what happened at the end of times as he was on there and he said his final words, it is finished and gave up the spirit. What happened when the soldier put a spear into his chest? Out came blood, blood, the sacrifice on the cross, water, the representation of his baptism, united. So that we, in our baptism, can be united with Christ's death. We bury the old Adam, with our baptism, and we are raised with Christ, as was he. And then Christ gives a little bit of a chastisement, or a little bit of a cautionary statement to Nicodemus and to us today. And he asks us to look toward the light. And to look toward is different than to look at. To look toward is not to inspect, to try to figure something out using human reason, as maybe Nicodemus started out and couldn't figure out how you can be born of water and the Spirit, or be born again by getting back into your mother's womb. It's to trust by faith. It's to seek and live by truth, the light of the world. To look toward is to depend on, just as a child looks to their mother, to depend on them, and possibly to receive cookies or to get a good hug. It's that look. It's that looking toward knowing it's coming. It's also what a man may have in hope. It's that looking toward for hope when he proposes to his then fiance, hopefully, hoping that she will say yes. And it's also that hope that someone has when you know that you've wronged one of your brothers or sisters and you ask for their forgiveness with the hope that you'll receive it. Looking toward versus looking simply at. Looking toward so you see through the mystery, so you trust what is to be revealed. Looking toward that you believe what Nicodemus was to believe, that Christ is the Son of God. Now, as baptized Christians, we are asked to take this gospel in a nutshell, to absorb it this Lenten season, to help us look toward Christ as the focal point of our lives, our everyday lives, not just on Sunday, but from Monday through Saturday, and share that gospel with others as a family of Christ, and to share Christ's words, those red words in the Bible. Believing is not seeing in our case, it's trusting in God by the work of the Holy Spirit. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds this Lenten season, looking toward Christ and letting the Holy Spirit help you understand this great mystery of his salvation and God's love for us. Amen.